This is Episode 7 of Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Richard Norton Smith. It starts after this. What's been the impact of religion on your life? You know, it's interesting. I was uh, uh, born into uh, the Congregational Church, sang in the choir, attended services, um, and, and subsequently, and in fact today, still feel, you know, it's probably, that's the religious tradition. Uh, the Unitar- <laughs> you know, the Unitarian Church, was the famous line, um, what is it, the, uh, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and the neighborhood of Boston. <laughs> and uh, parochial as it sounds, it probably has something to, it speaks to me more. Um, I'm fascinated by Catholicism and the papacy and, you know, the history of, and um, I probably know more trivia about that than, than almost anything else. Um, and and I, I love this pope. Uh, uh, you know, um, who, who, who ever thought? Um, and I just w- hope he lives long enough um, to appoint enough cardinals, which is, I think, clearly his his intent to make sure, at the very least, that there's no backsliding, uh, and that a um, a more generous, inclusive, optimistic um, approach to faith, and, and, and that, that's very appealing. I have problems with miracles. I'm, I'm, I'm just contemporary enough, I suppose. Um, I'm not, again, hopefully I'm humble enough not to deny. I'm just, I have trouble embracing wholeheartedly. But obviously, you know, you, you, and the wonderful thing about my strain of Protestantism is you, you don't need to believe in miracles to believe that to believe in something larger and better than oneself and to believe that life itself exists um, to be lived in service to others um, and uh, that Christ was real and his example um, can be and should be a contemporary Um, and um, something to be emulated. What impact did your heart attack have on you? Surprisingly little. Uh, I'm sure doctors would say not nearly enough. I had, um, uh, well, it was right after Thanksgiving, uh, 2010. I was living in D.C., slogging through the Rockefeller book. And uh, as you know, I had been invited, several friends, had taken pity on me and invited me to Thanksgiving dinner. And I was appreciative, but um, didn't accept. So it took a few days. But after a few days, um, a a critical mass of people began noticing that they hadn't heard from me. And one thing led to another. And John McConnell, good friend, then a speechwriter in the Bush White House, lived in the neighborhood and volunteered to check, came by. And I don't remember, I actually remember very little of the preceding three or four days. Turned out I'd had a heart attack, and I, it was a very good hospital, excellent hospital, um, less than a mile from my home. And that's where we went. And I remember thinking at the time, oh God, I'm going to sit in the you know waiting room of an urban hospital for hours, filling out paper, and, and of course I didn't wait at all. They took me immediately, and uh, I subsequently was told it was because I was having trouble breathing. So I mean that you know that's one way of cutting through the through the paper chase. Um, and so anyway, so I went in and I knew really nothing. I didn't have any fear, any particular sense of dread. I mean I knew in a very disembodied way that there was apparently something serious. But I also remember I don't forget that night. Turner Classic Movies, which is a godsend, um, and a wonderful escape from the horrors of contemporary life. They showed my favorite movie at 10.30 that night, Citizen Kane. 
and uh, I took it as an omen. Of course, in some ways, I was wrong, because the next day I had another heart attack and a clutch of blood clots, one of which knocked out my spleen, and the other, as I was told at the time, inaccurately, had uh, knocked out a kidney and probably uh, taken away the use of my left leg. Then, I remember, after that, I was returned to my room, and um, and, then, and I couldn't have been there five minutes. And nurses came in and said they were moving me to intensive care. And I said, and I actually meant, well, she said, you know, don't think it's because you've taken a turn for the worse or anything like that. I said, okay. So anyway, I, uh, I spent the next three days there. And uh, you know the story. People started calling. They started calling when I was, you know, I don't know how they found out. But anyway, Mrs. Ford called. It was the last time I talked with her. And other members of the Ford family, David McCullough, very thoughtfully called. He had a stint um, done and was offering reassurance. Um, in fact, I never had any kind of surgery. Never had. So anyway, um, but eventually... Uh, the, the real problem, I neglected to mention, on my third day, they took me up for more tests, and it turned out they found a bleeding ulcer, a significant bleeding ulcer, which may very well have been the original complaint. Anyway, the thing that actually, the only <laughs> physically uncomfortable, really, I wasn't in pain, but I had these killer hiccups, which I've since learned often accompany heart problems. And, and they were, were not like any hiccups you'd ever had. They literally, you felt like you were strangling. So that obviously was an enemy of sleep. And they were getting more and more concerned. Well, anyway, Friday, I'd gone in on Tuesday, Friday, in intensive care, finally nodded off, opened my eyes, 5 o'clock, there's this great earth mother nurse standing there. And she says, well, you know, you really put the fear of God in the, you know, in the poor switchboard operator or whatever the equivalent of the switchboard is. And um, I said, what do you mean? Well, President Bush had called and they didn't put him through. Which one? Uh, w. And um, <laughs> and they, they didn't put him through <coughs> because they thought it was more important for me to sleep. And, uh, and then it dawned on her, just as she was hanging up, that it really was, you know, President Bush wasn't a hoaxer, and uh, so anyway, we laughed about it later on, and we talked about it. But um, I came out of that. My, I, I swear, my first sort of conscious, coherent thought after I realized, you know, what had happened was, I can't die because I've got to finish this book. Um, that's dedication. It's the Rockefeller book. The Rockefeller book. I don't know whether the Rockefeller book almost killed me or saved me, but it was at the center of my existence. And in some ways, you know, maybe after that, even even more so. So when I finally finished it, I mean, there was more than the than the usual feeling of relief, and uh, um, I don't know about other authors. I mean. Most people would assume that you celebrate when you're done. And in fact, in my case, it's, it's, it's not. Um, there's a, a sense of melancholy. You're, you're, you've had this long, unique, intimate relationship. And you know this person better than anyone, including, above all, himself. And now suddenly they've been wrenched out of your life. And like any, you know, uh, close relationship, um, it, it breeds a sense of loss. So uh, that's you know, but they were complicated <laughs> feelings at the end of the at the end of the Rockefeller. I do, I do I, you know, I've said before, you start out to write biography, and you wind up writing autobiography. Because the, as the Rockefeller ended, it was the fiftieth anniversaries, the fiftieth anniversary of that night at the Cow Palace that I watched on TV 
you know, at, at the age of 10, because my parents wanted me to stay up late, where Rockefeller was almost booed off the stage. And it was, it was an image that stayed with me for life, and that I think contributed again to my emerging political outlook. And the things in your life that are you seem to spend most time with, you mentioned earlier, hurricanes. You've tracked them for years. I'm a hurricane freak. You, I once flew into one in 1985. It was a weekend in November, which is very late, of course, for the hurricane season. And there was a hurricane named Kate in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, simultaneously, Ronald Reagan was in Geneva having his historic meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev. And I was then on the Hill working for Pete Wilson. And someone on the staff who worked with the Defense Department, um, I, I should be forever grateful, contacted, you know, while well, Washington works, pulled some strings and got a journalist bumped from, from this air, air reconnaissance flight into the storm. And uh, I said, you, but you're going to be in Mississippi in, you know, eight hours. Cause they, they flew out of um, uh, Keesler. I think it's Keesler Air Force Base. In Biloxi? Keesler. Keesler. Okay. Anyway. But, but it didn't end there. I, so anyway, I got there. You sign your life away. You sign a document. Because I hadn't been through training. So I was a neophyte. They, they strapped you into the plane. They converted C-130s. And the remarkable thing is, you are literally strapped in crosswise, and the, the side of the plane is glass. They've been modified, so you could sit there and literally watch, watch the storm, you know? And, um, and they, they make four passes. You're in the storm eight hours, in the hurricane itself. You're in the air 14, 16 hours. But anyway, uh, depending on how close it is to land. And at this point, it was, it was you know, it was, a, it was a Category 3 hurricane. The strongest November storm on record at that point. And so I thought, well, this is pretty good. You know, I'm getting, you know, something for my money here. And, um, and I'll never forget the, what they call the stadium effect. It literally is. In a well-developed, mature hurricane, you have this very clearly defined eye wall. And you look down and you can see the ocean and flocks of birds that are trapped in the eye um, aimlessly, sort of. In any event, so we did that. But then I also, as it, I had someone else had pulled some strings and I had a seat in the gallery. When President Reagan returned from Geneva, he spoke to the nation at a joint session of Congress reporting on his trip. Literally, I think the helicopter landed on the hill and he, you know. So I had to get from Mississippi back to D.C. in time for the speech that night, 8 o'clock or whatever. And I just, I just, I walked into the gallery, you know, literally, I just, as the president was, was walking into the, into the house. So that was a memorable, that was a memorable day. I started to say other things like, you, you love to go to expositions. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a World's Fair freak. I, the <laughs> first was the New York Fair in 64. I've been to nine since, and um, Abu Dhabi uh, is on my bucket list in 2020. Why? But not Abu well, Dhabi in so some much ways, why nine you, expositions? You, you say, I, I said earlier, uh, an escape from the world we inhabit. There's nothing like a World's Fair. I mean, it literally is a fantasy land. Um, it's, um, it's life lived at a different pitch. It's the artifice of bringing a hundred countries, a hundred cultures together in one place. Um, for example, my mother, my, my long-suffering mother, in 1992, I said, look, I'll, um, I'll take you to Spain. She didn't, you know, okay, you know. Well, she fell in love with it when we got there. But the reason was the Universal and International Exposition in 1992 for the Columbus Quincentenary was in Seville. So, unfortunately, we made the mistake. It was late in the run. Don't ever go the last two weeks of a fair because everyone, everyone and his brother 
wakes up to the fact that it's about to close. We waited for nine hours outside the Canadian Pavilion. Um, and I am notoriously impatient. And she observed more than once that I would not wait in a line anywhere except a World's Fair. So there's something about walking through the turnstiles that your, your character is, 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 is transformed. Um, I have, you know, wonderful memories of every fair, and I can't wait. Which is the, the best one. one that you've seen out of the nine? Uh, Montreal's Expo 67. Uh, whose 50th anniversary we just observed was without a doubt uh, just magical, um, incredibly ambitious, a thousand acres on man-made islands in the St. Lawrence. Can you imagine anyone proposing to do that today? I mean, the environmental impact statement alone would uh, would take more time than you had to build the fair. But it was it was a vision launched by visionaries. Um, extraordinary ambition. It had the optimism of the mid '60s. Uh, I mean, looking back, you can. There are lots of things you can laugh at, but even more things that you can take heart from. And also, it was also the fair where um, cinema and cinema techniques uh, took a leap forward. Multi-screen. I mean, it was just a whole different way of seeing the world. You've made pilgrimages. To Queen Victoria's gravesite. Oh well, yes. I mean, it's and not easy. Others. It's only open two days a two days a year. Um, Why the angle? Not file? only that, I, I made a pilgrimage to the Isle of Wight, where her <clears throat> home is, uh, where she died in January two thousand one. I've stood in the bedroom and mentally genuflected. Um, Why? Uh, well, it's funny. You know, Noel Coward. Um, whose autograph hangs in my bathroom, um, along with <laughs> um, all sorts of uh, British uh, notables, um, had this lifelong obsession about Napoleon. He read every book. He had libraries of Napoleona, if there is such a word. And I, I feel that way about Queen Victoria. Uh, Victoria herself and the Victorian era. Um, I mean, I don't romanticize it. I'm not blind to the to the inequalities, to the to the grinding poverty, um, to the class structure. I, I'm, I'm not a celebrant, but I am um, insatiably curious. And every new biography about Victoria, and they keep coming. Um, I, you know, order and read and um, devour. Richard Norton Smith is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching his name in the video library at cspan.org.